why the vegetarian advantage? Why do people eating plant-based do so much better? And the, 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 the simple answer is whole food plant-based diets work because they address the root cause of disease. It's really that simple. So how do they work? Well, they essentially disable the drivers of chronic disease. And there are several, and, I'll, and we're going to talk about four. Inflammation, oxidative stress, lipotoxicity, and dysbiosis. And inflammation is, uh, what we know is, is, I mean, most people know inflammation when they get a cut and it turns red and puffy. But we can get this sort of chronic low-grade inflammation um, in, throughout the body. And it's a risk factor for almost every chronic disease you can think of, including the big ones, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, and cancer. Uh, it, what, what inflammation does is it promotes the growth of plaque, weakening fibrous caps, which you'll hear about from Dr. Esselstyn a lot, and it, it basically increasing the risk of rupture of these fibrous uh, plaques. It interferes with insulin signaling, and it increases insulin resistance. It promotes tumor growth and can trigger the loss of proteins involved in DNA repair. So what causes chronic inflammation? Well, overweight and abdominal obesity, especially when the fat is carried in and around the vital organs. This is what we call visceral fat as compared to subcutaneous fat, which is at the surface of the skin. Uh, processed Western-style diets, chronic, chronically elevated blood sugar causes inflammation, extreme exercise, lack of sleep, smoking, alcohol, pollution and stress are all things that can increase inflammation. So is there a plant-based advantage? Well, we had a systematic review and meta-analysis in 2017 that showed that vegetarian diets had, had a favorable impact on CRP levels, a measure of inflammation, in people that had been vegetarian for at least two years. And what they found was of eight studies, six found significantly lower levels of CRP in vegetarians, one found very little difference, and one actually reported higher levels in the vegetarians. We only have two studies on vegans that I'm aware of. And one was done in 2017 in Brazil with 268 participants. The CRP levels in vegans were 0.5 milligrams per liter. Lacto-ovo vegetarians, they were 0.8 milligrams per liter, omnivores 1.1 milligrams per liter. The second study was done in the United States in 2007, uh, only 63 participants, but interestingly, the, the CRP levels of vegans were almost the same as what um, was reported from the, from the Brazil research group. And this was um, 0.52 milligrams per liter. They were compared to endurance athletes. Their CRPs were 0.2 seven five milligrams per liter and they were both compared to people eating a western style diet and their uh, crps were 2.61 milligrams per liter so a lot higher than the omnivores in brazil a worse diet i would expect uh, oxidative stress uh, it, oxidative stress what we know is it induces damage to proteins dna cell membranes and it increases the development progression and complications associated with chronic disease. So what causes oxidative stress? Well, it's very similar to what causes inflammation, but an in, one of the main things is an insufficient supply of antioxidants from whole plant foods, uh, overeating, uh, uh, highly processed foods, chemical contaminants, products of high temperature cooking, alcohol, tobacco, stress, and air pollution, and basically, is there, and radiation. So basically what we're looking at is, is all of those things um, are, are sort of pro-oxidants, if you will. And so there's an imbalance between the antioxidants and the pro-oxidants. And, and for those of you that aren't really, don't really understand this whole antioxidant thing, oxidative stress is about free radicals in your body that are trying to steal electrons from other molecules because they, they, they're missing an electron. But when they do that, they turn whatever they stole the electron from into a free radical. And it starts this chain reaction of destruction in your body. Now, what, a, what, what a, an antioxidant does is it comes along and says, excuse me, free radical, would you like an electron? 
And the free radical says, why? Thank you, yes. But, so it donates an electron, but it doesn't turn into a free radical. So it remains stable. That's what an antioxidant is. So th that, that's very helpful. And we need more antioxidants and fewer pro-oxidants. So is there a plant-based advantage in terms of oxidative stress? Well, I, I, you know, do your search on PubMed, and the list of studies is really extensive. I've got a few written down here. Um, but the studies completely consistently demonstrate vegetarians, including vegans, have more favorable antioxidant status because they eat more fruits and vegetables and other antioxidant-rich foods. And, and that's, you know, that's the bottom line. Uh, this is something called lipotoxicity. This is another major driver of chronic disease. Um, it's one that many people have never heard of. But it's one that y you need to know about because it is hugely, hugely important. So most of us, or all of us, I should say, have this way of storing excess calories. And it's called our adipose tissue. We put anything that is consumed in excess of what our body needs gets stored as fat in adipose tissue. But when our body gets overwhelmed with trying to shuttle this stuff to the adipose tissue, just so much is coming in. What can happen is we can actually store lipids in tissues that are not meant to be lipid storehouses. So we start to store lipids in the liver, in the heart, in the pancreas, in the muscle tissue. Now we do store some lipids in the muscle tissue in intramy as intramyocellular lipids, and, and those are needed, they're little important little organelles but they get sort of overrun with intramyocellular lipids that are not functioning well when we're eating too, too much of this stuff. So this is, lipotoxicity is very important. It can cause cell death or cell damage. It can even, as little as 1% of lipids in your pancreas can destroy beta cells. So this is really important. It can cause tissue inflammation. It can cause mitochondrial dysfunction, insulin resistance, and especially when your liver, when you end up with this sort of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, you're storing these lipids in the, in the liver, um, your liver makes your whole body insulin resistant when that happens. So even 30% at, at, at a level, 30% reduction in liver fat can reverse insulin resistance. It's really quite phenomenal. This is important, um, just important knowledge uh, to have. Uh, it can cause elevated triglycerides. It can cause elevated uh, blood glucose. So lipotoxicity is, is something that we just need to be aware of. What causes it? Overconsumption leading to overweight and obesity. Diets that are high in fat, especially saturated fat and trans fatty acids, and diets that are high in refined carbohydrates, particularly sugars, and fructose being more, even more damaging than glucose. And, and so one thing to understand is, as soon as I say fructose, people think fruit. But one thing to understand is that the liver has a capacity to be able to deal with the fructose in fruit efficiently. It's when you take fructose, concentrate it, and pour it into your sodas and, and into your processed foods and start eating it that way, that the liver becomes overwhelmed. It can't deal with that much fructose because fructose isn't like glucose where your whole body can deal with it. The liver has to deal with it. And so it gets overwhelmed very, very, very quickly. Uh, so plant-based advantage here. Well, vegans actually have the lowest rates of overweight and obesity of all dietary patterns. They have lower level, levels of um, lipids in the muscle, the intramyocellular lip lipids, which are a marker of li lipotoxicity when compared to matched omnivores, and they have the lowest intakes by far of saturated fat. So they're at an advantage. And finally, dysbiosis. Dysbiosis compromises the integrity of the gut barrier with numerous adverse uh, health consequences. We get a decreased supply of essential nutrients, reduced immune function, increased inflammation and oxidative stress, and elevated risk of obesity and chronic disease. So what causes dysbiosis? Well, unhealthy Western-style diets, for sure, uh, antibiotics, medications, stress, and poor dental hygiene can all be contributors to dysbiosis. Is there a plant-based advantage? 
Well, the, and, and there are many studies that have looked at uh, microflora in people eating different dietary patterns. So we're just going to look at a couple of studies from 2017, the mo most recent studies. The first study was that Brazil study where they actually looked at um, microflora as, as well as, as, as other indicators of health like CRP. The vegans had the most favorable microbiota followed by the lacto-ovo vegetarians. And in this study, the authors actually concluded that exposure to animal foods may favor an intestinal environment which could trigger systemic inflammation and insulin resistance. Uh, in the second study, this was a study from Italy, a smaller study, only 29 participants with just uh, very small numbers, 10 vegans, 12 lacto-ovo vegetarians, and 7 non-vegetarians. But in this study, um, the lacto-ovo vegetarians and the vegans uh, had the most favorable uh, microbiota, but the people who were lacto-ovo vegetarian uh, had ha actually had the, um, the most favorable of all, which is interesting, and it may be because they were consuming a lot of yogurt. I'm not, I'm not sure. But both had reduced genotoxicity as well. So the bottom line is the most effective dietary patterns are dietary patterns that minimize pathogenic dietary components and maximize protective dietary components. <clears throat> when we look at the research and look at what components in the diet are actually associated with reduced risk of disease, there are certain components that come up over and over again, and they are fiber, phytochemicals, a plant enzymes which are responsible for converting some of these phytochemicals into their bioactive metabolites or their active forms. Uh, antioxidants, anti-inflammatory compounds, plant sterols and stanols, pre and probiotics, and then the micro and macronutrients that come mainly uh, from whole plant foods. Those are, I mean, ma macro and micronutrients come from all foods, but the healthiest are from whole plant foods. So if we look at this list, what I really want you to notice is, is if, you, if, you know, if you look at um, every single item here and think about where these dietary components actually come from. Well, first, fiber. Where does fiber come from? It, it comes from plants, only plants. Uh, phytochemicals. Well, phyto means plants. It's chemicals in plants. Antioxidants, predominantly plants. Anti-inflammatory compounds, predominantly plants. Plant sterols and stanols, of course, plants. Pre probiotics you can get from a variety of things, but it's, it's the prebiotics are only plants. The probiotics are anything with, with the bacteria, you know, fermented foods. Um, so, so the bottom line is, and the World Health Organization said this, uh, you know, in 2011. They actually said it in 1999 even. Uh, but the plant foods are where the protective components are concentrated. And if you look at the pathogenic factors in food, the tr you know, you see trans fatty acids and excessive saturated fat and refined carbohydrates and excessive sodium, new 5GC, which is a pro-inflammatory molecule, chemical contaminants, all the products of high temperature cooking, pro-oxidants and, and TMAO, and you look at all of these things and think, well, where do these things come from? Well, th they come from the two categories of foods that the World Health Organization pointed out in 2011. Processed foods with added fat, sugar, and salt, and animal products. Trans fatty acids, processed foods, saturated fat, mainly animal products, refined carbohydrates, processed foods, excessive sodium, processed foods, new 5GC is the pro inflammatory molecule in meat, uh, chemical contaminants. Uh, you know, we're looking at things that largely move up the food chain, uh, and, um, and products of of high temperature cooking, so a lot of them are, are concentrated animal products, but in other things as well. Pro-oxidants like heme iron, animal products, TMAO, uh, animal products. A TMAO is trimethylamine and oxide, and it, it comes from carnitine and choline we mainly get by eating meat, and our bacteria in our colons um, change, the T change the choline or carnitine into TMA, and it gets shuttled to the liver, and it gets changed into TMAO, and it's very atherogenic, and it can increase the risk of kidney disease, and so on. So uh, again, two categories of foods that are most, most pathogenic. And so 
when you look at what people are actually consuming, you know, 39% of our calories are coming from added, fat, added fats, oils, and sugars. 30% uh, from animal products. 22% from grains, 90 or 95% of which are refined. So refined carbohydrates. 9% from vegetables, fruits, and legumes. And probably half of that is orange juice and ketchup. You know? So <clears throat> you look at that and you say, oh, I understand why most of the people in this country are overweight or obese and dying of chronic, you know, diet-induced diseases. Look at what we're eating. Most of what we eat is a threat to health. That's the bottom line. Fortunately, uh, we have a choice. So I, want, I just want to introduce you to the Vallejo family. And this, this family, uh, this is Andreas. And, and just, just to give you a little case study. Uh, he was diagnosed with cancer in, um, uh, well, about, I guess, six years ago now. He was 36 years of age. It was cancer of the salivary gland. And he decided to adopt a plant-based diet after doing a ton of research to give himself the best chance of survival. And I think that and he is in remission, by the way, but the most exciting part of this story is uh, what happened to the rest of his family because when he announced his, his vegan diet, his plant-based diet, uh, the whole family said, whatever diet you're going on, we're going on with you. We, we just want to stand with you in, in this journey. And, and this was really quite remarkable because this, this family was a, a, a foodie family. Their favorite pastime was going to the best restaurant in town and ordering the biggest steak and the $500 bottle of wine. So this was, this was their favorite, you know, it was, it was the thing they did. So this was huge. But the story I want to tell you is what happened to Carlos. Because Carlos uh, was diagnosed with type 2 diabetes in 1993. He had just had a serious heart attack. He had hypertension, high cholesterol, peripheral artery disease, early stage renal failure, uh, recurring gout, and he was being treated on 17 pills a day and 40 units of insulin. He asked his doctor how long he could expect to live, and his doctor said, probably two years if you're lucky. And he was told that every one of these diseases was progressive and irreversible. There was nothing he could do to change the course of these diseases. But when he went on a whole food plant-based diet, after less than a year, Carlos was taking zero insulin and zero pills. His fasting glucose was absolutely normal, A1C normal, blood pressure 115 over 70. His arteries opened up without surgery. He had no peripheral artery disease. Normal, his kidney function went back to normal. He had not one single further recurrence of gout. And uh, five years later, six years later now maybe, uh, his numbers have been maintained without any of the medications he was on. His uh, heart disease reports, he had very severe coronary artery disease. His ejection fraction was 50% or reduced, and, and that was 2005. In 2017, uh, no evidence of abnormal cardiac activity whatsoever, and he had a normal ejection fraction of 61%. This is, you know, 12 years later. It's really quite astonishing. But this is what is possible. Not everyone is willing to make the necessary lifestyle changes. But everyone has a right to know that lifestyle changes are a safe and highly effective treatment option. That, to me, is the bottom line. We know enough. We know enough to protect people by developing policies that make healthy choices the easy choices for people. We know enough to make lifestyle medicine the first line therapy for individuals with lifestyle-induced chronic diseases.